Hey ladies, welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham show. If you are thinking about starting a coaching business, maybe you are an expert in a certain area, or maybe you've been doing something like let's use photography as an example for a long time. And you know that you have really honed your skills and you want to now share with other people how to do what you're doing and becoming a coach is just the practical next steps but you're not sure where to begin. What do you need to become a coach? What are those tactical things? And what are those things that are going to help you do so effortlessly and sensibly? If this is you and you are in this place of wanting to start a coaching business, but not sure where to begin, I have all the answers for you today by the way of my guest, Lindsay Maloney. Lindsay is a business coach and she helps other business coaches start their businesses, launch their businesses and scale their businesses effortlessly and sensibly. Oh my gosh, that sounds so amazing. Just that word effortless and the word sensible because we get so inundated with so many tasks and so many things that we see online and so many things that other people are telling us that we have to do or we must do or we should do that sometimes it stops us in our tracks and we don't even know how to take one step forward to be able to take that right action to do what we want to do or create the goals and dreams that we want to come true. So without further ado, Lindsay Maloney, welcome to the Robin Graham show. Thank you so much for having me, Robin. I'm excited to be here. I'm happy to have you. And this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart because obviously I am a business coach as well. And I see so many struggles with just people in general trying to start something new and not knowing where to begin or how to take the right first steps. And what happens so often, and I'm sure you've seen this too, people start, but then they haven't put everything together in a way that it's a strategy for building a foundation. And so then they have to backtrack. So I'm really happy that we're going to have this conversation today and help guide other people on those steps to take those five things that they need to do to start a coaching business so that they're starting off on the right foot and not having to backtrack, backpedal and take twice as long as it could take if they do this the way that you suggest. So with all of that said, I would love for you to tell the listeners a little bit about you and your journey to, to get to where you are today. Well, thank you for having me again. And when you were talking about backtracking, I always think of your business as that expensive hobby that you just continue doing and you're ready to let that go. And that's where I come in. I am born in North Dakota. I grew up on a farm. I live in a very small town. I met my husband when I was four in front of the house we live in now. I don't really remember the whole conversation. I'm sure it was real deep at four years old. We have three kids. I homeschool them. I also work a full-time job and I've been running a coaching business for over 10 years. I, I always say five or six of those first years, I had zero clue what I was doing. And then I finally immersed myself into all things business coaching after trying all kinds of different things and then developing something that I wish I would have had when I had only one kid and then two kids and something that could have really sped up my business. But I feel like I went through all of that so I could help others now. Okay. I have to stop you right there because I love, love, love so much of what you just said. So number one is you went through everything you went through so you can help people now. And I'm such a firm believer in that, that God make things happen to us, but he allows things to happen for us so that we can then turn around and help other people. So I love that you said that because it's so true. I always say that, you know, if you're struggling to find your purpose or find your niche, look at your journey and where you've come and the things come from and the things you've learned and who is it that is 10 steps behind you. And maybe that's one year, maybe that's five years, maybe it's three years, whatever that distance is between you and them, you now have that expertise to help them. So I love that you said all that. And then a cute story about you and your husband, love that too. And I think it's absolutely remarkable that you have a full-time job and you are a business coach helping other people at the same time as homeschooling your, your kids. And I'm sure the, the listeners are thinking, 
what on earth? How does she do it all? So I know that you're big into journaling and, or plan, I shouldn't say journaling, but planners. You're yes. big into planners. <laughs> and I'm guessing that you use that as a tool to keep yourself organized together, time management, and all of those things. Oh my gosh. I've been using a planner since I remember being in school and they handed them to us in the fourth grade. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can write when I'm going to go to grandma's now. And I can plan ahead when I'm going to go to grandma's. Cause that was like the only thing I ever had going on. <laughs> and I've been using a, pl a planner ever since. And I use several of them. And I always joke about, you just can't have enough of them. Yeah. There's absolutely no way I'd be able to balance all the things if I wasn't able to plan digitally and physically. Do you have a a specific calendar planner that you love the best? Um, I love many. I have a few different ones in front of me. I have one that I made. I have the commit 30 planner. I have a, a sauna for digital. And then what is this one? Oh, the bandu planner. I really like that one. And Laura Casey's power sheets are super helpful too. Oh my gosh. Okay. Listeners, this is like such great information, especially if you're just starting out, because one of the key things for starting out is being organized and creating a strategy that makes sense from point A to point Z. And we've talked about this in other episodes before, but I would love for you, Lindsay, to now dive into those five things that you need to start a coaching. You have an idea and a lot of people are like, you should make this into a business, or maybe no one has said that to you, but you have that pull. I always described it as a, a calling to do more, but I wasn't sure what it was. And I would say God is dangling a carrot in front of me and I'm just going to keep following it. I have no idea where I'm going and I have no control. And I like that because I don't want to have control sometimes when it feels like, what the heck am I doing here? I'm just going to keep following. But then there, there comes some other pieces you actually have to do some tactical things I remember making the mistake of just having a website and blogging. And then maybe somebody besides my mom will read my blog posts, hopefully fingers crossed, or continuously doing things that really weren't pushing my business forward and spending way too much time working. So we all come through journeys for a reason. I, I, I honestly love working. I could work all day long because I'm happy with what I do, but that doesn't mean I should especially when you have a family to take care of. And I think a lot of people are like, I'm working on my business. I have to set this off to the side. Like your main reasons why you wake up every morning. Don't forget about those. I was working at night after I put the kids to bed really early in the morning, too much work, too much computer, just busy work. I didn't know what mm -hmm. to really do. And I thought if I'm sitting here, it'll look like I'm trying Maybe I'll just compare things for, maybe I'll compare blog posts for another three hours or whatever it is. No plan whatsoever and no direction as to who I'm going to help and how I'm going to help them, which is like the number one biggest mistake coaches make when they come in is they want to help everybody do everything. And you're not Walmart. You can't help everybody do everything. And coaches have such big hearts and they truly do want to make everyone feel happy and better and make progress, but we can't possibly do that. We're a specific tool in a toolbox and a screwdriver cannot do everything that a wrench can do. And a hammer can do everything that this can do. We have to embrace what kind of tool we are mm -hmm. and how much of your journey can you take and consider it so you can help others. That's like the number one ignored thing is your journey and your history because it's boring to you. You've already done it and you don't even think about it and you go into something else because you saw Someone really shiny on Instagram having a business that looks really cool to you. So you try to be like her. No one's going to notice you then because you're trying to be somebody else and you're ignoring your entire history that can actually change a life. So embracing who you are first, choosing something that you actually have experience in so you can write the words and say the right words that people can actually feel connected to you when they're listening or reading anything that you put out there. That's really important. Now more than ever, it's really hard to trust people online because everyone's trying to do something, right? Uh -huh. So we really need to pull people in by being genuine and uh, sharing our story and showing everyone who we really are, even those really boring pieces of you. Like I considered having kids and having a nine to five. Growing up in North Dakota was super boring. 
Why would I share that? Because I'm going to encourage somebody who might live in a small town who doesn't have a laptop lifestyle and it's cold here and I don't like the busyness of cities or anything. That's going to draw people that are that I feel really in common with. So that's the number one biggest step and the most common ignored. Mm -hmm. I agree 100%. And it's something that I say all the time as well, that your story, your journey is what is going to connect you to other people. And it's everything that has happened for you over the course of all these years is exactly what you can use. So if you're struggling to identify your niche, identify your purpose, take a look at, at your values and like your values are so important for making sure that you're fulfilled, but also that you're serving other people that you're meant to serve. Because if we're off track and we're working with people that aren't aligned with us, that we're going to be distracted. We're going to be frustrated and we're not going to be able to serve them to the best of our ability. So it's really important to make sure that when you're looking at all of those things, you're looking at your values, your visions, your purpose, and all of those things that have led you to where you are today. So I love that you said all of that. And I think it's super cool that you are in a small town and you love that, like being in the city and being one of these big influencers, taking pictures on a yacht and doing this and doing that isn't where you want to be. You want to be at home, working your nine to five, coaching other people and helping them discover how to start something new while putting your family first and foremost. So I love all of that so much. Okay. So we've talked about really tapping into your experiences, your journey to discover what your niche is and who you want to serve. So what's next? Decide how you're going to serve them. That's part of it. You're going to pick one thing that feels really dialed in. Like you have a staticky radio. And for me, I could say, I am going to help coaches start their online business. But what if I just, what if I dialed it in a little bit further to, I help coaches start their online businesses. Cause that's different. I don't work with coaches who've been doing this for 10 years. I want to work with people who are like, I don't even have a website. I don't even know what an email service provider is. That's where I love to come in and teach. That's my favorite place to be. So embrace what you really love and don't be afraid to dial in on who that person is. I think we're all way too afraid to dial in because Mm -hmm. it means less people and it really doesn't. And then after that, we're going to go into like list building. How are you going to actually bring people into your list? Lots of coaches come in and they don't even have an email service provider set up because they didn't even know it it was a thing. No one's born knowing all of this. So that's totally fine. Don't be embarrassed. Yeah. Um, I always say we don't know what we don't know. And that is the benefit of hiring a coach. And I think our target audience, our soulmate clients are very similar. Like I love to, I also work with people who have started their business or maybe they're rebranding and they're, they've just lost clarity, lost direction, and they need that push again. But those people starting out to me, it, there's so much opportunity, but what happens is people try to do it on their own. And when you try to do it on your own, a lot of times you, you get lost in the shuffle because you don't know what you don't know. So I mm-hmm. love that you just said that like email marketing, what is that? What do you mean a platform for that? You mean, I can't just email from my computer. Right? <laughs> it's pretty fascinating. The things that Once you've been doing this for a while, you've learned and mastered. So now you can teach someone else. Okay. So I interrupted you, but I just had to emphasize that. No, you're fine. I'm used to it. I have a four-year-old. I'm used to being interrupted. (laughs) (laughs) No, and I think it goes along with, you don't know what you don't know. And then how are you going to actually make this happen? What's the point of you blogging? I see so many people just blogging. And then what if somebody comes and reads your blog, what's going to happen? I don't know. Do you have your coaching packages up on your site? No, maybe you're charging $50 for an hour of coaching. That's a whole other story. What happens when people want more to to connect with you? Do you just have a a contact page on your site? What are you doing? And so many bits and pieces are missing. And that's why you really need to come in and, and talk to somebody who's been there and who's made all of the mistakes. But I always say, what's the point though? What's the point of blogging? What's the point of you talking about something on social media? We have to have a point. It should be to build your list for number one. But besides getting clients or students, you got to be building your list. So is your is your website optimized? Do you have content that you're consistently putting out there? I'm a big proponent of being consistent with content. I have a podcast. I have a blog. I have all of those mediums activated. You do not need to do all of those. Just pick one. And usually blogging is the first choice because it seems the most comfy, but more and more people are tapping into podcasting, well-known. And sometimes you just, I podcast in the mornings, Robin, 
on Saturdays, we don't do video. And my guests love that because they're like, oh, awesome. I can just throw my hair up in a bun and Mm -hmm. talk. And I love that. But pick a medium. You got to pick a content medium and then pick your point. If you're going to talk about something for the next quarter or the next month, why should people listen to you? How are you going to get reimbursed to be a subscribers for that? You got to have a plan for that. And then once they're on your list, how are you going to take care of them and nurture them and make them feel like it was the right choice for them to sign up to be in your world in the first place? I love that. So we briefly touched on the tech component when you mentioned email, but I would love your perspective because this is my opinion, of course, but I am a huge fan of a website versus starting your business on Facebook or Instagram. And the reason being number one, if you house a blog, that's great because your blog can be your first source of content. And then you can repurpose from there. But SEO is a powerful tool that a lot of people don't understand and don't tap into. And you can put as many blogs as you want up, but if you don't have SEO on those blogs, then people aren't going to be able to find you. Your website has to be designed in a way, and the copy, the blog posts, the content, all of that has to be structured in a way that there's a strategy behind it. And that strategy is basically search engine optimization, SEO. Mm -hmm. I would love your perspective as far as like the tools and tech that you need when you want to become a coach. Like what about the website? What about Facebook? What about Instagram? What about a Facebook group? What is necessary versus what is out there that other people are doing that we don't have to do Mm -hmm. up front to become a coach, these things may come later. So prioritization of these text tools systems, what would you Mm. say? Yeah. Cause there's a lot of shiny tech out there and high priced tech that I remember getting caught up with click funnels oh, and, me all too. Of the, and I was like, okay, this feels like I'm in a boys club and I don't want to be here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's how that. I felt too. I just felt it was, it was superficial in my opinion. It wasn't yeah, for me. Yeah, and, and I know people who are having incredible success with it, mm-hmm. but it wasn't for me. That's one of the most important tools of all is knowing if it's for you or not. It could be Sam card. It could be thrive card. It can be anything. There's so many options. There is no right or wrong you have to figure it out yourself. That's the thing. And uh, we lean way too much on people speaking about a program because they're affiliates and they'll talk about it until they're blue in the face. And we cannot be so easily influenced when it comes to picking the tools in our business. That's a recipe for trouble, especially when you're just starting. So you have to decide what feels right for me. Here's an example. I've been using Sam card for many years. When I first started, I used Boone Clerk. And then when it made financial sense to move over, I went over there. Then I was, I had a little bird in my ear telling me, you should switch to Thrivecart because they do this. And you have to be really good at this. Maybe it takes practice. You have to go and look at something online, like Thrivecart, for example. And I think that's amazing. I went over there and I thought, this just doesn't feel right for me, for all my students that I would have to bring over. Sounds like a hassle. I'm going to stick with what I do. I'm not going to follow the crowd. I never been a crowd follower. I'd rather stay in the back of the room and observe and then probably make my decision long after everyone else does. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's how I run my business. Just because somebody says to use this and this, that doesn't mean I'm going to, because there's so many different options, but then you get stuck in the paralysis of deciding what to use. I like to keep my business pretty lean. I don't have a team. You know who I have working for me? My mom. I trained her on Pinterest and she's my Pinterest marketer. This, this is, is so mom. funny. My mom. So this is so funny. So I grew up in a small town in Illinois in the Midwest. So we have that in common, but my mom, I don't live in the, is that small of a town anymore. Now we're on the East coast, but my mom is my Pinterest manager. Oh, funny. <laughs> so that is so funny. I trained her and it is so funny how she has mastered it and she is almost competitive with the clicks and the likes and all of those things. It's hilarious, but she loves it. Okay. So I digress, but anyway, I just had to share I, no, that. I, I love that. Have that. My in mom common. printed out one of her pins that went viral when she first started and she has it like framed up in her office. So cute. <laughs> That's so cool. I've never heard of anyone else do that. And yeah. I think that everyone's like, you got to have your team and all this and you do not. You would think for me with, I have a lot of stuff on my plate. Every afternoon, I have three kids waiting for me in the living room to go and teach preschool and second grade and sixth grade. I don't have a team to help me because I don't need one. I run it really lean. So anything that you want to know about how I run my business, I'm very transparent, but I don't want anyone to get caught up in 
comparing email service providers for three months and then trying new things all the time and really never moving forward. You need the basics. You need an email service provider. You need a website. You need a content medium. If you want to have Instagram, go have Instagram. Don't pour yourself into Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest all at one time. You will get super overwhelmed. Master a platform, set up a system, get ahead with it, and then move to the next thing. The Facebook group is always the most popular question. Should I have a Facebook group? I know you want one because you asked me, so just start one. And the first people in my Facebook group was my mom and my grandma because she heard about it from my mom. (laughs) So I let them in. And this was years ago. And everyone gets so discouraged because they don't have the get 40,000 people in your group in 30 days. I wonder how many of them are real people in the first place. Don't worry about the numbers. We all start at zero. There's some really really clever ways to build your Facebook group in a genuine way, not to stop rushing everything. And that's really all you need. And then everything else will come into place as you grow and build and sell new things and bring on clients. I love so much of what you just said, because so many of us tend to rush. They see something or we see something. I've been guilty of this over the years. And then I had to backpedal and realize that, oh my gosh, like, why did I just invest in that? Why did I waste that time trying to learn that? It wasn't for me. And so many people get sucked into that. And then looking at the numbers and thinking that I have to have all these numbers or I won't have enough to convert. And that's not true. It's really if you are a heart-centered business coach, your main goal, your main initiative should be to build connections and relationships because that is how you're going to build trust, which will then convert to paying clients. Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels. Numbers don't mean anything if people are not connecting with you emotionally. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important point that, yeah, if you want to start a Facebook group because you want to have that community, then that's awesome. But don't let somebody else who has a successful Facebook group influence you or intimidate you because the reality is they have been at it for a long time. They have a strategy in place for that. And that is their main source of converting clients. And when you first start out, that's not going to be how it is. Mm -hmm. You have to be in there and be present and share a lot in order to get that type of conversion with a Facebook group. So I just wanted to say that, but I also don't want people to put their, all the eggs in that basket because we don't own Facebook. They could take your group away at any point in time, just because you said something they don't like, or you put a link up and they didn't like that link. So you have to be very cautious with where you put your energy. So we're back to that emphasis on having a website. And letting that be the tool that you use to be discovered and drive traffic to it and then to your email list. Well well said. And another thing I want to add on to that is the number thing. We don't have control over that. I think that's just another way for you to beat yourself up about something, whether you giving yourself a, a made up timeline or a deadline or being discouraged because you only have five people in your Facebook group and What if those five people came to your house and knocked on your door and said, we're really glad to be here. There's a lot of Facebook groups, but we're really glad we're we're in yours. We can't wait to learn from you. Would you just sit there with your arms crossed and say, I'm waiting for a thousand people to be in here. So I'm not going to say anything yet. So sorry. Would you do that? I sure hope not. So stop disregarding small numbers and be grateful for the people who are in your corner because they can choose to leave whenever they want. So you show up for them. You show up as if there is that imaginary number in your head and take care of the people who are in your world, because you're not going to get any more people in your world. If you're not grateful for the ones who are 100%. I love that. So, so important. Okay. So we've talked about the, let's go back to our list here. When we were talking about five things. So we have your niche, your purpose, your expertise, your story, your journey. That's number one. We talked about systems and tools. We talked about social media a little bit, like choosing your platform. What else? Mm -hmm. Are we organic marketing? And we talked about list building the tech a little bit. Organic marketing is always pushed to the back burner of your business because you're always used to doing Instagram posts and relying on that one post to explode and bring in all the things for your business. That's not going to happen very often, especially now. So organic marketing, which is like Pinterest all the way. I don't know about you, Robin, but a lot of my clients always hold off on learning Pinterest. They always put it off because I believe that they know how powerful it will be for their business. So they're afraid. 
of the results. So they're always pushing it off. And I'm always like, come back in the vehicle because we need to work on organic marketing. If you don't have organic marketing in place, no one's marketing your business. You're going to have to just push the car. You're going to have to get out of the car with the brakes on and try to push it down the road. And that's really hard. So Mm -hmm. for example, last year, I didn't have a whole lot of ads running, but I didn't really notice it because I, um, not the money, I noticed that (laughs) I wasn't spending as much money on ads, but Pinterest was just feeding my email service provider because I set up a long-term game plan with Pinterest and I'm not relying on Instagram to feed my business Mm because that's a big mistake. So Pinterest is my big organic marketing plan because I have consistent content going out and I utilize that. And that's so important. If you're blogging video, whatever you're doing for your medium, you got to be marketing it over there. Otherwise you're missing out on a huge piece of growth for your business. Yeah. And we just had an episode. I interviewed Rachel Ngom on the show. And we talked all about Pinterest and having a strategy for that. So I will link that episode in the show notes because it is something that is a really powerful tool. And it's something that like you, I always emphasize that with my clients too, and how to set it up so that it's strategically going to work for you and not just be sitting there as a DIY tool for, for treats at school next week. Recipes. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Is there any other, did we miss any of the five or did we hit them all? No, the last one is going to be the, the create your coaching packages. Yes that's, yes, yes. that's huge. I get on to discovery calls and um, they'll say, I want to have my first $10,000 a month. I say, okay, great. What's your website? Let me check all your coaching packages. And, oh, this is just $60. Do you, have you done the math? If you want a $10,000 a month, how many clients are you going to have to work with next month at 60 bucks an hour? <laughs> not possible. So we think that's very obvious to price, but apparently it isn't because we are terrified to put a price on our website. I recommend you do three. I recommend doing three coaching packages. I'm a big believer in that. And I had a joke on Instagram a while ago, how to raise your coaching prices. And I said, go to your website, edit, delete the numbers you have and type bigger ones. That's it. We make way too much of it. We have to sit there and think of how people are going to feel if we increase our prices to $10,000. And what are people going to think of me? How dare I ask for $6,000 for somebody to work with, with me? We play all kinds of stories in our head. And somehow, every time you increase your prices, you always get clients all the time. I started out charging my clients $2,000 with one package. Now I'm all the way up to three packages because I've learned the hard way that three packages work really well. And I'm up to $10,000 and I've been triple booked out with them for almost two years. Mm -hmm. And that's really important for you to know that it's possible for you. You don't have to be afraid to increase your prices, but having those three, my philosophy behind that, I don't know if you guys go on discovery calls, but when you do, usually they're deciding whether yes or no, they're going to work with you. The three for me seems to be switching that mindset to yes or no, to which one should I choose? And it's always, it always goes between the middle and the high. My lowest price package is the least sold uh, for years. And that's fine with me. So it's interesting how that sales psychology works. And I, I recommend everyone do that. And most people are doing one or two, but when they move it out to three, it feels better because mm-hmm. they can work with clients longer, give them more time and offer them more additional or take away some benefits of working with them too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And so it's interesting. Do you have your prices on your website? I didn't see them, but I didn't look, I didn't go into your packages. Yep. They're all there. So do you recommend that the prices be there? Yep. I do. Okay. Interesting. Cause I've heard mixed things and I actually don't have my prices there, but I guess I should have my prices there. I think it's a, I think it's great for the, the, even the client to know how much just to have in their head. Oh, if I saved up this much money, I could work with this person or I can budget this person with, to work with this person. I think it's sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And I've gone both ways throughout the course of my, my career. So that, yeah, I, I think I can see that. Yeah. It makes, well, you don't go shopping and say, Oh, I'll just hope for the best. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's a great perspective, but it, and it comes back to perceived value. It's what are they going to get? If you're telling someone that you're going to help them start their business and their business is going to be successful, just looking at your price 
pricing of your packages. That's huge. So mm-hmm. just having somebody else to encourage you that, hey, that perceived value is there. This is worth it. it it's really encouraging. So again, it's we don't know what we don't know. And pricing is just one of those things. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, so that's packages and pricing. The next question I have for you, and then we'll wrap up is, what are your thoughts on certifications? Do people need to have a certification in order to be a successful business coach? I ruffled some feathers last week (laughs) saying that I don't believe you do. And it was a great conversation. And I put the disclaimer, this can be different for, I have a client who is a nurse practitioner and that's different, Mm -hmm. but I, I believe that you don't because I've heard from way too many people who will email me and say, I want to start a business, a coaching business too. Do I need a certification and which one do I need? And they think that they need some kind of coaching certification and you don't. And I said, none of my clients have ever said, what kind of certifications do you have? They will ask who I've learned from, like my mentors and programs that I have um, participated in. And I do list that because I think that's important because somebody will say, oh, she's learned from, I respect that person. I would like to learn from her. I think that being transparent with the courses and the mentors you've learned from is really cool. And not a lot of people do that. So do that. But I don't believe you do need a certification. That comes to you acknowledging your own history and your journey. You guys can go find that post on my Instagram feed where we went back and forth a little bit on it. And I had some students chime in and and say, I would rather learn from somebody who's lived it, not somebody who studied it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's their perspective. We're, We're all entitled to our own but I don't want to see it hold you back from at least getting started. Of course, you can learn new things and new strategies and you can get certified in different things, but don't let that be the reason that you just can't quite get started yet. I think that's why I don't believe in it because people use it as a, as an excuse to not do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I I feel the exact same way as you do. I, I would be the first to admit, I love to have like credentials. I think they're important for some things, Mm -hmm. but we go full circle back to the beginning of our conversation. And that is that your experiences, everything you have gone through, everything you have done, everything you have learned from is enough that you can now serve and help someone else. And I, and I know I've seen some push out there for mandating. If you're calling yourself a coach, you have to become certified. And at at that point, maybe we're a mentor instead Uh, of a coach. But I think the important thing to remember is that if someone has been on a journey and they've been doing this for several years, they can teach you something. And so we're back to the very beginning. Look at your experiences and discover what can you now help someone else with to decide where you're going to put your energy, who it is you want to serve and how you're going to serve them. And then start doing all of these other strategies and tips that Lindsay shared with us today. Thank you so much for being here. And will you let the listeners know, how can they connect with you, learn from you, maybe even hire you as their coach? Yeah, um, easy. Just go to lindsaymaloney.com. I have a freebie vault with lots of workbooks that you can go and grab for free. Lots of classes you can watch for free. I host a monthly live class, how to find clients. So if you're ready for that. I have a crash course in coaching, building your coaching business called ready for clients. So you can go visit that readyforclients.com. And I just mainly hang out on Instagram. So if you want to see those posts that I was talking about or message me, I would love to say hi. And that's just Lindsay underscore Maloney. Awesome. And the one thing we didn't tap into was getting that first client. And how do you get that first client? I guess I'll have to have you back on the show. Yeah, (laughs) I love that. (laughs) All right, Lindsay, thank you so much for being here. And listeners, if you found this information helpful, please share it. Take a screenshot of listening to it and share it in Instagram and tag both Lindsay and I, and we will share it and get more eyes on you too. Have a great day, everyone. And we'll be back next week.